Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining our weekly AMA, Ask Me Anything, and I do mean anything. Happy to take all your questions. We encourage all your questions. My name is Brian Horlick. I'm the senior partner here at Horlick Levitt Delella, and we are condominium. If you want to become a condominium genius, I suggest you, your friends, your relatives, your boards, your property managers, everybody come and listen to us every Wednesday at 12 o'clock noon. So as I've said before, for those of you that have listening, you've heard this, but for those of you that are new, I'm just going to say that um, we started our AMA Ask Me Anything in March of 2020, and we started it in response to the insidious epidemic, pandemic, COVID-19. And what we realized very quickly when everything shut down with the emergency order was that the condo business is a people business. And as a condominium lawyer, as a condominium professional, we are always in touch with board members. We are always in touch with the auditors. We're always in touch with condominium managers and even unit owners. Can you believe that? And all of a sudden we were in touch with nobody other than by telephone and by, I guess, uh, Zoom, Zoom conference meetings. Uh, and we felt that if we moved forward with a weekly AMA, it would be a good opportunity for everybody to somehow virtually get together, um, see how we're doing, check in on one another, and have a forum here to ask questions and get answers. If I recall, back in March, there was a lot of misinformation going on and people were coming out with all sorts of emails and opinions which were, let's say, inaccurate at best. So every Wednesday, we're going to continue our Ask Me Anything. We're now in stage three, of course, of um, the province's reopening. The intention of our office is to continue the AMA and morph it from a COVID-19 uh, heavy uh, question and answer to continuing that, but to also uh, continue with legal education for everybody who is in the condominium industry and legal education as they say education begins at home and and in fact th for those of you that are home you can be educated uh, we are sending out a weekly video but that our associate lawyers are doing and that goes out every friday and those videos are on various topics dealing with condominium law such as kitech piping such as right of entry, uh, such as suing, suing for uh, construction deficiencies, uh, noise issues, how you deal with them, water penetration, and the like. So, um, to move on, we have a lot of questions. As you know, there's um, a tremendous amount of um, uh, new things happening re regarding uh, the province of Ontario, stage three, um, for many of you. You know that uh, every Tuesday, our office sends out a, really a award-winning COVID-19 FAQ. And it's the most recent and most up-to-date uh, information on COVID. In addition to the FAQs that we have there, all information in our FAQ, our Frequently Asked Question uh, Bulletin, um, is backed up by sources. We have footnotes for every government source by which we get our information. So. Let's go quickly. Um, we do have a number of questions. Um, I will say this for those of you that are in the know. Um, this here is what you call a mask right here. And this is my new mask and I'm wearing it in condominiums. Yes, when I go to a condominium and I go see my children, lucky them and lucky me, I am wearing a mask. And you say, why am I wearing a mask? I'm wearing a mask because the city of Toronto has passed a face covering slash mask bylaw requiring all um, people that enter and remain in the common areas of condos to wear a face mask or a covering. So uh, we're gonna go to the questions. Uh, we'll start there since there's a lot of them and then we'll continue with, with some other updates. Number one, Harlan Stavis. Does our board have to vote on having a virtual AGM? If we do, does the vote have to be unanimous or can it be the majority of the board? 
So Harold, uh, sorry, Harland, a hardworking, dedicated board member. Um, your board doesn't have to, your board has to have an AGM. Your, your condo corporation has to have an AGM. And as you will recall, there was a, with the emergency orders that came out, um, there was a suspension of AGMs. There was a suspension of annual general meetings. Now, um, that suspension said that the Condominium Act provision that set out that you needed to have your annual general meeting within six months of your year end was suspended. And it was suspended um, until such time as the emergency order was rescinded or revoked. Now, the emergency order uh, was revoked, and it was revoked um, on July the 24th. And as soon as the emergency order was revoked, the time started to click for AGMs. And why did the time start to click? The time started to click because the amendments to the Condom Indian Act, the amendments due to COVID-19, which were found in Bill 190, those amendments, which, which were put into the Condominium Act as part four, set out that the temporary suspension period of all of the amendments, of all of the emergency orders in the Condo Act, the suspension was going to, um, was going to be from the period of 120 days after the emergency was terminated. So every Thing that the amendments, the emergency amendments uh, of the Condo Act, all of those amendments that were put in place are only going to be effective for 120 days after the day that the emergency was rescinded, which is, which is in July the 24th. So if you're good in mathematics, I hope there's some auditors listening here, they will tell you that 120 days after July the 24th is November 21. And so you must have your AGM um, within, um, uh, within a, the period of time, um, which is, which is uh, 90 days after the emergency order is over, or if the AGM date was with, fell within 30 days of the date of the end of the emergency order. So if your AGM fell within 30 days of July 24th, you had 120 days in which to hold your AGM. So bottom line, um, we have a chart that is set out in our recent FAQ. If you're not getting it, we can send that to you. And basically the AGM chart sets out all of the new AGM deadlines. And a lot of them are October 22. So if you had a June 30th um, deadline for your AGM. In other words, if your uh, fiscal year end was December 31st, your normal AGM deadline would be June 30th, but your new deadline is October 22. Similarly, if January 31st was your year end, your normal AGM would be July 31st, and your new deadline for the AGM is November 21. Um, so, so on and so forth. Um, there's a number of various year ends set out in our chart. I suggest you take a look at the chart if you've got it. If you don't, we'll send you one and it will set everything out. So getting back to Harland, you need to have your AGM and your AGM can be either in person or virtual or let's say uh, by paper. Now let's go through the various types of AGMs that are out there or that you could potentially have. Number one, you could have an in-person AGM just like we always used to have, but those in stage three social gatherings indoors are capped at 50 people. So if you have a really small condo, uh, you might be able to have an in-person AGM, but again, uh, you're capped at 50 people and those people have to uh, practice social distancing, which means you're going to have to have six feet or two meters uh, minimum distance between attendees. Given that your condominium manager would likely be there, although not enthusiastically likely to be there, but still be there, and your lawyer may or may not show up because 
you know, the lawyers may say, hey, you know, I can't go to a million AGMs and come back to my office because people will be thinking that, you know, I may be asymptomatic and they don't want to work in the office anymore. So between the auditors, uh, lawyers, uh, staff, um, you, you're not going to have a AGM of 50 people. You're probably going to have an AGM of 40, 43 people, 45 people with the practicing of social distancing. Now, if you have a larger condo, as many of us do, that would mean that many people would not be able to attend an in-person meeting. They also may not want to attend an in-person meeting if you have a community, let us say, that is made up of a lot of senior citizens, they may not want to go. And in fact, with the rate of um, COVID expanding to, uh, you know, the younger segment in society, maybe the younger people don't want to go. But in any event, you would have a maximum of 50 and probably less in person, meaning the rest of the owners who would like to attend the AGM would have to attend, uh, would, have to, would have to submit proxies. So you'd have in person with a cap of 50, everybody else would have to submit proxies. Um, I would suggest that for an in-person meeting, you'd have to have a reservation system and you'd probably wanna have something put in place that, that it would be a maximum of one person per unit to give everyone an opportunity who wanted to attend the AGM. Now, if you're not going uh, in person with proxies, you could have a virtual meeting. You could have an electronic slash virtual meeting. Um, and this would mean that um, everything from attendance um, to uh, voting would all be done electronically slash virtually. And there are a number of uh, service providers that can assist on that. There's also what you can call a hybrid meeting, in which case you would have a virtual meeting component, an electronic slash virtual meeting component, in addition to an in-person meeting. So you would have two ways. Um, the, the meeting can be virtually, and in, in addition to virtually, um, you could have uh, personal attendance. So you can have a combination of virtual and in person, it's called a hybrid meeting. Um, and then again, um, you know, so again, you could have only a virtual meeting, you could have a hybrid of a virtual and in, uh, and in person, or you could have only in person with proxies. Uh, basically, uh, you know, these are the type of things that you can do. And I guess you can even have, you know, nobody coming except, you know, uh, the chairperson, the scrutineer, um, um, and a proxy holder and everybody else, you know, by way of paper proxy. So uh, getting to the um, question of Harold, um, you know, the, the, the manner in which you're going to hold your AGM would be done by way of um, a vote at the board, board level. The board is going to decide, you know, how, what is the best method for our community to move forward with the AGM. Now, as everybody knows or should know, um, the, as I said, the emergency order um, is, is over. You now have something called um, um, the, the uh, Bill 195, which is now in place of all emergency orders. So what's happened is that when you had the emergency orders, they were only to last for a certain period of time. And prior to the expiration of the emergency orders, because you will recall that Doug Ford you know, once a week, you would, would uh, say, okay, our emergency order is extended for another week, or our emergency order is extended for another 30 days, etc., etc. He doesn't have to do that anymore because the emergency orders have been rescinded, but they've all been put into um, the a Bill 195, which is called an act to reenact the reopening of Ontario. So everything is now, every emergency order that was there is now in Bill 195. Bill 195 allows the orders to be um, extended every 30 days for a year. Um, and after one year, it allows the government to even extend it a further year. And so, as I said, the um, uh, amendments to the Condominium Act are going to expire on November 21. And one of those things is the fact that you do not need at the present time a bylaw to have an electronic voting or a virtual electronic meeting. But after November 21, you will need a bylaw in place. So my suggestion is for those condo corporations that have not yet um, uh, moved forward with um, 
passing a electronic voting slash virtual uh, meeting bylaw. You should do that on a, an immediate basis and you should do that before November 21st because if you don't do it before November 21st, you will need to have a, vir a bylaw to do a virtual uh, meeting and, and uh, it's going to be a problem for everybody. So, um, Harold, you, you need to have a vote of your board on the, on the way forward whether you're going to have a virtual AGM or whether you're going to have in person with proxies or whether you're going to have a hybrid. Um, those are the things that you have to do. Now, the next question here, which is another um, excellent question, our board is trying to arrange our AGM by October 22nd, and that's because I presume your fiscal year end was December 31st. Your normal AGM should have been June the 30th, and because of the COVID-19 uh, suspension, you're now at an October 22 deadline. And Harold, uh, Har Harland, Har Harland, I'm going to change your name for today to, to Harold. Harland advises that the um, providers, the electronic providers are booked until at least the middle of November. And is that a problem? Well, the it sounds like a problem in that um, you may not be able to hold your AGM by October 22. But I understand that um, there are um, providers out there and there's daytime meetings and there's nighttime meetings. And I'm going to suggest that, uh, you know, there's going to be a solution there and uh, we'll be able to, our office will be able to provide um, a, an up-to-date solution on that at our next um, AMA Ask Me Anything next week. So we'll be discussing solutions other than existing providers that are booked up because that is an ongoing issue now. Hadib Nasehi, next question. May you please elaborate on should boards update policies or waivers or both for enforcement and liability opening up of amenities? So there's two questions within this question. Uh, one deals with policies and one deals with waivers and both of these uh, issues deal with opening up amenities. So as you know, the amenities are common elements the amenities uh, were basically closed during the pandemic uh, in stage one and stage two. In stage three, the amenities uh, have been allowed to open um, other than, uh, I believe, saunas and steam baths. So what's been going on as far as waivers? Well, I'll tell you that in, in many situations for many condo corporations, um, they, are, they have used waivers for a long time. And waivers are, um, is, are documents by which a person who signs the waiver gives up certain legal rights, such as the right to sue. And a lot of condo corporations have always used waivers for their amenities. So if you wanted to use the uh, health club facilities, the uh, gym, uh, exercise room, the tennis courts, a lot of condo corporations as a policy had you know, a waiver document for use, usage of the common elements. Now, many condo corps haven't had that. And now that we have the issue of uh, COVID-19 and the reopening of amenities, the issue of waivers has come up for, for some condo corporations for the first time. So a number of condo corporations, in fact, I think a lot of condo corporations um, have been moving forward with um, having um, legal counsel Ad, um, address and uh, draft waivers for their amenities. In addition to the drafting of the waivers, um, a number of condo corporations have been setting out policies um, as to what is the expected behavior moving forward with the amenities. So um, I think that waivers are a good thing. Uh, waivers need to be uh, drafted carefully um, in order for the waiver to be enforceable. Uh, owners or residents or whomever is going to sign the waiver and needs to fully understand what they're signing and they can't think that you know it's a waiver for the gym when in fact it's a waiver for the pool they have to be advised and you know the waiver should therefore be drafted in such a manner that there are places on the waiver uh, for signatures uh, so that you know that would add to the fact that the person signing has you know reviewed those sections of the waiver um, policies, of course, are important, and we're going to get to uh, policies shortly when we're going to be discussing 
um, the policies that are now required in the city of Toronto uh, and in York region for uh, face coverings and face masks. Jerry D. Donato, good afternoon, Brian and all participants. Yes, Jerry, you're the culprit that made me, force me to play my saxophone. So I've been down in the basement now. My wife's keeping me there and she insists that I continue to practice before I make my next big show for our AMA. Melody Roche, hello. Jerry Di Donato, good questions coming up now. Indoor AGM, we have 205 units. Past experience, approximately 60 attend in person. What tools do we have and can legally use to restrict in-person attendance? Well, um, you know, past experience for you, Jerry, says 60 attend in person. So as you know, the cap on indoor meetings um, is 50. So there's going to be 10 irate people in your condo at least. Um, the bottom line is for if you're going to move forward with in person and there are condos out there that really want in person because they're used to in person and they do not feel that their community can properly, you know, uh, you know, deal with um, an electronic meeting, which would ultimately mean though those people would be in a sense disenfranchised from coming and participating in their meeting. As I suggest before, if you're going to go with an in-person meeting, you need to do it by way of reservation. And it should be one person per unit max, of course. Um, this way you can try to get as many people as you can to attend the AGM. And unfortunately, after 50, you're done and you have to go with proxies. Now, there are some condo corporations that are not, for example, um, in an area where there's no land and they do have some uh, common areas uh, sufficient to hold perhaps an outdoor meeting and if you held an outdoor meeting your amount of people is 100 um, of course keeping in mind social distancing so if you had a lot of land and if you were able to you know if 100 people would be what you would normally expect as a maximum for your AGMs you could have consideration for an outdoor meeting um, that's a thought. I mean, we, we need to be flexible uh, in 2020 uh, with the situation that we're facing. Next question. Do you know if Toronto York Region mask mandate for condos is for indoor common elements only or includes outside? Okay, so let's talk about face masks. So what, what has happened here is that the, the issue of face coverings and face masks is not a provincial matter. It is being dealt with on a municipality by municipality basis, meaning a city by city basis. So the first city out of the gate was the city of Toronto. And the city of Toronto passed a bylaw on July the 7th. And that bylaw, very bylaw which required um, the wearing of face coverings slash masks for indoor public spaces where you had enclosed public spaces you were required to wear a face covering or a mask and basically um, this dealt with public spaces such as malls stores and and uh, places where the public was invited to attend so there was a requirement for face masks and coverings face coverings now, the problem with that bylaw, and as I said, this was two weeks ago, um, the problem with the bylaw, and I mentioned it, um, was that nobody thought about condos. Nobody thought and asked themselves, how different is the um, lobby of a high-rise condo? How different is that to a commercial business or a store or a hotel lobby? Um, and why would you think it would be in a, a, the best practice to have a face covering uh, for a commercial um, mall or a hotel and it wouldn't be a good idea or the same considerations wouldn't be done for um, 
a condominium. And so Doug Ford, who I know listens weekly to this AMA, heard us. He heard the poor condominium people. And he, what he did is he made an amendment to the bylaw, and the bylaw now includes the enclosed common areas of condominium buildings. So if you have uh, somebody coming into your building, it's a condominium, um, it's going to be uh, a, a mandatory mask or face covering policy to um, if you're going to be in the building and it's a condominium. Now, as we're on the topic of the City of Toronto um, and their face covering bylaw, I'm just going to set out that um, it's important to have a, a, as part of the uh, obligation under the bylaw, you as a condominium corporation are required to adopt a policy. And the policy has to be in writing and any bylaw enforcement officer can stop by your condo corporation and ask to see a copy of your policy for inspection. So this is a policy that deals with wearing masks or face coverings in the city of Toronto. And it's going to be the same thing uh, in York region. The face mask slash, uh, the face uh, covering slash mask policy is effective as of today in the city of Toronto. You're required to have the policy. In addition to that, um, you are required to post signage at all entrances to the enclosed common areas. And enclosed common areas would be things such as your elevators, your lobbies, your laundry areas if you have them, meeting rooms, gyms, etc. You got to have uh, big signages up at the entrances and it's got to say that the masks are required to be worn and it has to cover your nose, your mouth and your chin. Um, and it, as I said, for Toronto, it's come in force today and for York Region, it comes in force on Friday. So it's for indoor common elements only. It's not for outside common elements. Um, again, um, condo corporations are able to uh, pass policies or rules that are stricter than uh, the provincial guidelines or the city bylaws. So, uh, you know, if the board and the community uh, themselves felt that, you know, it was difficult um, to have social distancing even outside, I don't know how the outside would be set up, um, a consideration could be uh, for a mask to be worn outside. But right now, for the City of Toronto and York Region, if you're looking at the bylaws, it's for indoor common elements. So, excellent, excellent uh, uh, situation that we have. Um, question here, outdoor AGM, use of a tent. Is this considered an outdoor or an indoor meeting? And if considered indoor, is attendance restricted from 100 to 250? Any privacy issues? Boy, Jerry, that's a good question. So what Jerry's suggesting here is to have a hybrid of an indoor-outdoor meeting. So he would he's suggesting to have the uh, AGM outside uh, with some type of a um, tent, and I'm going to assume the tent is going to be a covering only um, for the the top and it would be open on all sides. So um, I'm going to I'm going to assume that the use of a covering only for the roof as opposed to the sides might be acceptable to be deemed an outdoor AGM. And if it is acceptable and classified as an outdoor AGM, the max capacity would be 100. Good question. Andrea Thompson, with our AGM Coming up, what are your thoughts on candidates and people canvassing the building? Well, uh, this is, uh, you know, really something that uh, we all have to think about. You know, if you're going to have an AGM, everyone's going to soon be in the groove because, you know, with the emergency order having been revoked, it seemed to have opened up the, uh, the flood of AGMs. And I mean, it's a flood. So what do you do? People want to run for the board. They want to get, they want your vote as an owner. How will they get to know you? Um, they want to knock on your door. They want to introduce themselves. Um, and you would like to meet them and you'd like to see who's running uh, on the condition that, um, that there are no 
respiratory droplets between you and the person who's coming to seek your vote. So how are you going to ensure that someone who's coming to your door is going to be both informative and is going to be uh, not um, having his or her respiratory droplets in the air? I don't know how you can do this. Um, you know, you could not open your door. Uh, that is uh, probably the safest thing to do, but it's not the most effective if you'd like to get to know the tenant, uh, the uh, candidate. Uh, perhaps a, a um, you know, some type of maybe a, a meet and greet, maybe a meet and greet outside, uh, you know, practicing social distancing might be something that uh, owners might find acceptable. But, you know, then again, that has to be somehow dealt with because you don't want, you know, any of those people who are outside to be, you know, closer than um, two meters or six feet. And if you had it inside, it's 50 people. And again, um, you know, you really have to be careful about, you know, how you limited the distance between people. So, uh, you know, maybe the answer is, um, and I hate to use this, but virtual. Maybe the answer is for people that are running uh, to uh, put out a little, you know, two minute video and to be able to, you know, send it off to, to various owners. But then again, they may not be able to get the emails for those owners. Um, so I think you have people have to be creative, maybe put up a sign, say I'm running for the board. Um, and, you know, you can see my, uh, you know, can't, if you want to see me virtually, go to www.whatever and there's a, a two minute thing of, hi, I'm Brian Horlick and, you know, I'm running for your board type of thing. Maybe that could work. Really something that uh, we need to think about. Uh, Andrea, I like the question because uh, it's new, it's novel, and it's uh, right up there with uh, everything that we're dealing with today. Uh, next question. Hello, can we still send notices by email even though the emer emergency period has ended? I.e. pick slash notice of meeting. So as I said before, um, the uh, the ending of the emergency order uh, had within the legislation a transition period. The transition period is 120 days after the end of the um, uh, after the end of the emergency. And so everything that was in the emergency order is still effective until November 21, and that includes. Um, the uh, service of documents electronically. So you're good until November 21. Property manager, and what can reference for hosting an AGM via electronically today now that the emergency order is over? If I think I understand this part of the question, again, you have until November 21 to host an AGM electronically without a bylaw after November 21st, you're going to need a bylaw to have an electronic meeting, a virtual meeting, or electronic voting. And normally, when you go to your condo lawyers, they should be providing you with a bylaw not only for a virtual meeting, but for electronic voting and a virtual meeting. That's what you should be asking the, the corporation lawyers for. And, um, you know, that's the, that's the thing that you need. Andrea Thompson gym openings yes or no okay well you're asking a lawyer yes or no my answer to you is maybe it depends so right now with stage three you are allowed to open the gym however as with everything else in stage three and everything else that you are allowed to open you always have to maintain social distancing and you need to ensure that the equipment is clean sanitized etc so that leads us to the question of who is responsible for ensuring um, social distancing and who is responsible uh, for ensuring that the equipment is clean. So you open your gym. For example, you have a area where there's weights. People use the weights. And there's a number of people that are using the weights every 20 minutes, let's say. Um, you know, you finish your repetitions, you put the weights down, uh, you go to the next set of weights and somebody is waiting for the weights you just put down and they want to use them. So the thing is, um, the law says that you need to, you need to 
um, if you're going to be sharing um, or providing equipment, the equipment has to be sanitized between uses. That's in the regulations. So gym, you're allowed to open. If there's equipment that's being available for the use of the gym or, or the fitness area, that equipment has to be sanitized between uses. So today it's very socially acceptable and pretty well what people do or should be doing is when they're finished with their weights or when they're finished with their treadmill, etc., they should themselves be taking a sanitizing um, towel or towelette and cleaning the treadmill and cleaning the weights. That's what the residents should be doing who are using the equipment. And of course, they should also be doing social distancing. So really the million dollar question is, what is the responsibility of the condo corp in this type of situation? And I'm going to say that you should use signage to ensure that the, the residents who are using the equipment sanitize that equipment after their usage. And you need to put up signage uh, to ensure that they are practicing social distancing. In fact, you need to either tape up equipment, for example, treadmills that are right next to each other so that you're using every second or third treadmill. And, and you've uh, taped up the ones that are not able to be used so that you're forcing people to respect social distancing. So um, as far as what should the responsibility be of the condo corporation, I'm gonna suggest that the condo corporation in the area of recreational gyms needs to go in and do spot checks. In addition to the spot checks, I'm gonna suggest that the condo corporation do a heavy duty clean um, you know, at least once a day. Um, if your residents are not uh, respecting the social distancing, if they are not respecting the fact that they have the responsibility to, uh, to sanitize these, uh, this equipment after usage, um, I hate to be Mr. Bad Guy, but the answer is going to be to shut the gym because the corporations are one of the parties that has the responsibility to ensure compliance with uh, what was the emergency orders and what is now uh, Bill 195. And as we've said before, there are significant penalties for corporations, for directors, and for those that have care and control of the premises for non-compliance with what is now Bill 195. So if there's not a respect for the unfortunate situation that we are all finding ourselves involved with, then your answer is to close the amenities. And while we're dealing with amenities, I will also say that um, there are amenities that you reserve and that you reserve and that you are able to use for a few hours, like a barbecue area or a, a card room uh, or a movie room and for those amenities that are subject to reservation and are subject to being used let's say in blocks of a few hours I would suggest that the condo corporation should have its own cleaning staff uh, disinfect and sanitize after usage all right next question opening playground this is from Laura McCarney opening playground in Durham region in the same manner as region play at your own risk what are your thoughts um, yeah you play you play at your own risk but you do have in a privately owned uh, area such as a condominium corporation you own your units and everybody um, owns together the common areas and there's a management company uh, or a manager that is um, you know, overseeing the, the common areas uh, and a board that's directing that, you are going to expect that, you know, those, uh, many of those amenities uh, are going to be sanitized and clean and safe or they wouldn't be opened. And so if you are play at your own risk, you, you know, you want to suggest waivers. And even with waivers, if there's negligence, uh, you don't want to be on the wrong side of a lawsuit. Okay, Gina Avalis, a board member. I hope it's going well for you. Our board is asking if we would be able to charge only residents 
using the gym, extra cleaning services incurred? So I'm going to suggest that the answer is no. Um, you, you are not able to charge certain residents more than other residents for using common elements. In the same token that I cannot get a rebate because I live on the first floor and I don't use the elevator. Why should I pay for that? Or I don't have a car. Why should I pay for the cleaning of the garage? When you live in a condo, you are like married. It's like you're in for the good and you're in for the not so good. All right, Jerry, our 2020 AGM deadline is November 21. We Do we hold a virtual meeting in September to pass the electronic meeting bylaw and pay an extra $1,500 on voting or wait until the virtual AGM in, no, in November and pass the e-meeting bylaw then. So you have a, a November 21 deadline. Um, I'm going to suggest that, you know, you could wait um, for your virtual AGM, provided it's before November 21, and you could have your virtual AGM and at the same time put on uh, the agenda as a voting item the electronic voting slash um, virtual meeting bylaw. So you wouldn't have to have two meetings. You could have one meeting. As long as it's uh, on or before November 21, you could have your AGM and at the same time have a voting agenda item in addition to all other business, the electronic voting slash um, virtual meeting bylaw and you'll save yourself 1500 bucks. Melody Roche, can a building ban smoking on balconies without grandfathering existing owners? There was a recent case, there was a recent case law where the judge stated that they don't have to grandfather them. What about vaping? So Melody, it's good to see that you're reading your cases because yes, in fact, there was a recent case um, that um, said that grandfathering would, was not always required, and so you're correct there. You can um, put in place rules, um, smoke-free environment rules, and you can specify within those rules whether they relate to um, indoor common elements or outside common elements or inside your unit. As you know, the Smoke-Free Ontario Act deals already with the indoor common elements, but it doesn't deal with what happens within your units or the outside common elements, such as uh, balconies and terraces. So, um, you know, smoking and vaping are dealt with in the same, in the same way under the Smoke-Free Ontario Act, and in most uh, rules for condos, they're dealt with the same. So grandfathering, we always thought that, oh yes, you must, and the reason we thought, oh yes, you must, was because rules have to be reasonable, and the law is that um, if you've been doing something for a long time, it would be unreasonable all of a sudden for the corporation to say you can't do it. So that's where grandfathering came in, um, which I understand uh, from reading the papers and listening to the news that the word grandfathering um, has uh, significant negative overtones, historical overtones, and at a certain point in time, we will not be using that word any longer. Melody, there are no cigarette butts involved with vaping. Can the board ban those? How would, it, how would it be possible for owners to requisition a meeting at this time with the pandemic? So um, you can ban vaping, you can va ban um, uh, cigarettes, as I said before, um, the rules dealing with smoke-free environment deal with both cigarettes and cigarette butts and vaping. The question is, would it be possible for owners to requisition a meeting at this time with the pandemic? Absolutely yes. In fact, we've already chaired uh, some virtual meetings and are chairing more virtual meetings uh, dealing with requisitions for a number of things, including um, removing the boards. So it's good to see that you know, once those requisitions started coming in, as they are now coming in, that uh, people have moved past thinking about COVID-19. They're, they're, they're back to being condo people. So yes, um, you can do a requisition. You can do it virtually. It's a one agenda item. You know, whether 
you know, for example, a board removal, whether in favor or against, and if you want to have an election of board members if there's a replacement, or if you want a requisition, um, you know, some type of other information, it can be done electronically. Again, um, you know, the requisition meeting, no different than an AGM, can be done virtually, can be done in person with a 50 people cap, can be done as a hybrid, can be done with paper. So there's a lot of various options available. Adib Nasehi, should condo corps have their own policy written by their lawyer to enforce and review the bylaw in respect to it as a private property? Well, I think that um, you should always have your, bylaw, your bylaws or policies reviewed and uh, ultimately written by your condominium lawyers. I mean, they know your condominium declaration and your bylaws and the existing rules that you have. Um, so yes, I think it's important that um, to keep uh, your, your building having quality governing documents, you should use your lawyer, of course. I will tell you this, that there are some corporations out there that, you know, they, they want their managers to do double duty, maybe triple duty. So they want their managers to manage the building. They want their managers to give great legal advice. They want their managers to give great financial advice. And as we all know, uh, the managers need to draw the line um, when, they be, when they're asked to become lawyers and they need to draw the line when they're asked to become auditors. That's not part and parcel of what they do. So a, a corporation or a board will only realize that the rule that they thought was a great savings of money because they didn't use their condo lawyer, but they used their condo lawyer manager. So their manager became the lawyer. They'll never know how bad the rule was until they try to enforce it and then it may cost them a lot of money. Next, Adib, follow-up. Should corps wait until there is more of a generic policy out there that they can adopt for enforcement? I think if you need to enforce things, um, you're going to need to move on it quickly, and you can't wait for generic policies. You need to, you know, speak to your condo lawyers and, you know, get things moving. Bruce Amson has a good question here. Are there penalties for not following the face mask bylaw? So the answer to this is there are certain condo corporations that have certain provisions in their declaration that say that if rules are not being followed um, or policies are not being followed, then that is um, a, a um, just give me one second here. Hold on. All right. You see, that's what happens when you don't pay the rent. The lights come off. Um, actually, we're on, on a timer. And the timer must have thought I had passed away as I'm doing this AMA, but no, I'm still alive here. Um, so you can uh, have penalties for a face mask bylaw, and that would be dependent upon the wording in your declaration, because there are declarations that would allow um, breaches of you know rules and and policies um, to be um, indemnified under the. Um, corporation documents. So the answer is it, it is very possible, not in every corporation. Marissa Cirelli, how are you? Opening gym, party room, etc. Cleaning staff leaves at three. Is it best to open during their work shift and then close amenities or open and get a waiver signed? So, you know, you have, for example, let's use the gym. The cleaning staff leaves at three. So I'm going to assume that at three o'clock, your gym is in a beautiful condition from a point of sanitation and cleanliness. What happens is everybody comes home from work and those and quite a few people are now working out in the gym. And let's say your gym closes at 10 o'clock or midnight. It's going to be a real mess in there by the time everybody's finished. Um, I'm going to suggest that um, as long as there's proper signage and, and uh, proper education of the owners for the gym, that they are in charge of um, sanitization of the equipment after usage, I think you can continue using the gym. And again, as I said before, you'll have to do certain spot checks to make sure things are being followed, such as cleanliness, sanitation, um, and social distancing. And if it's not going to work for you, uh, you're either going to have to close up that amenity, or you're going to have to somehow um, rearrange the hours of the cleaning staff, and if it's a really, you know, sought,ly highly sought-after gym, and people are always using it, the board needs to consider 
you know, having further staff come in because again, you know, the corporation is there for, you know, running the corporation. The board is there to assist uh, the corporation and the corporation is there for, you know, the amenities for the owners. And if there's a demand and the owners want it and they're prepared to, you know, if the, if the owners are prepared to pay the extra cost, then that's something that you have to look at. Harland, the sax was the highlight of the AMA. Well, I'm glad I was wearing my other glasses today, so I said the sax word instead of the other word, which is the mistake I made last time. Because um, last time I said the sex was the highlight of the a AMA, and people were frantically telling me with signage, no, no, change your glasses because it was sax. So thanks a lot, Har Harland. I'm glad you appreciated it. And when my wife lets me out of the basement, uh, I'll come back with my three saxes and uh, give you a good show. Scarlet Guy, Minute Taker. Scarlet, how are you doing? Scarlet's been doing minutes for years and does a great job, I got to tell you. Scarlet, we have found virtual meetings to be efficient and productive. Would you agree that it is now best practice to hold meetings, including board of directors meetings, virtually rather than returning to in-person? So I will say that right now, as we are here in the pandemic and everybody is telling us um, that, you know, COVID-19 is still here. We can't get overconfident. Uh, Doug Ford is, tells us all the time that if we let down our guard, this thing is going to bite us in the backside like we've never been bitten before. So I will say for this point in time, uh, virtual board meetings, I think, are, are good. Uh, I think it's uh, why not? You can do all the business that you want with a virtual meeting. And in fact, for many people, it's it's more time time effective. And for AGMs, well, look, uh, it's it's we, we're in a situation that is odd. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot that is lost in the democratic process by having virtual AGMs. So yes, it's it's a factor from a time point of view. And yes, you can get a lot of your business done virtually, but you, it is so, um, it's such an antiseptic, sterile situation that um, for, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of more of a hybrid thing that those who don't want to go in person, and I'm talking about after the pandemic, those who don't want to go in person, but still want to go to the AGM, they, they should be able to like click on their computer from wherever they are, attend the AGM and vote. For those people that actually want to go to the AGM, that should be available to them as well. But during the pandemic, it's better really and truly to take a pause, I think, on in-person meetings. Now, if you had an in-person or a hybrid meeting, you know, when you think it through, uh, you know, you'd have a maximum, really 40, 43 people, you'd have one person per unit, you'd have a lot of unhappy people who might want to go to the AGM, or you'd have nobody who'd want to go to the AGM. But if you had those 43 people, you'd have to have six feet between them, you'd have to have a huge space, uh, you'd have to be, you know, have to think out how you were going to do registration, because you don't want a whole lineup of people coming in. You could see it sort of like going to Loblaws, where you have a big lineup outside and everybody is six feet from each other and people are coming in what a, one at a time to register, which is going to take a very long time. So is it doable in person? Yes. Is it suggested at this point in time? I'm going to say reluctantly it's not suggested, although I, I, I feel strongly that we're missing a lot in the, in the democratic process by not having in-person AGMs. And hopefully, you know, after a cure, a vaccine comes out, this will all be you know, a distant bad memory. Next question, Laura McCarney. Some Durham region condos do not want to have a face mask policy. Would you recommend it? Well, look, uh, Laura, uh, as I said before, I may look like a doctor, but I'm really not. I'm a condo lawyer. So if the health authorities are suggesting that, you know, you are doing the right thing by wearing a mask as you're keeping yourself and other people safe as well because of respiratory droplets. You know, I can't argue with, you know, I can't argue with the health authorities. And so I would suggest if that's what people are 
are of the view that are you know medical professionals then I would recommend that as well Daniel Kasha one of the great managers of our time how are you Brian is there any distinction for indoor pools and gyms in condos re wearing mask wearing bylaw well the there is a provision um, in the um, uh, for example, in the city of Toronto bylaw that exempts somebody from having to wear the face mask uh, while uh, being provided a service or w when they're engaged in physical fitness. So there is an exemption um, for that. Um, I would think that, you know, if, if you're doing certain things in the gym that, you know, you could do with a, uh, the face mask on, I would suggest that you know the face mask stay on but if you have um, if you're doing things where really uh, you need it you should wear it I'm just going to tell you here um, I'm going to grab it for you it says here and this is not in um, bill um, this is not in the amendment to the face mask bylaw this is not in bill 651 but this is in um, the original bylaw that was amended and it said for phys physical activity it said the face mask slash the mask slash face covering policy shall permit temporary removal of the mask or face covering where necessary for the purpose of receiving services or while actively engaging in an athletic or fitness activity so you, there's an exemption while you're engaging in the activity um, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, maybe for weights you should wear the mask and maybe for jogging you should not. Next question. Oh, and you asked about indoor pools. Same thing, you know, you're not going to swim with, with the mask on. And that's why the exemption is there. Gordon Marshall. How as management and staff do we enforce the City of Toronto face covering bylaw should a resident choose to ignore the notices? Well, the... Face covering slash mask bylaw is not an option. It's mandatory. I would suggest two things happen if a resident chooses to ignore the notices, as some will. That, number one, it should be handled like a regular compliance matter so that a letter should go out from the manager uh, to the resident, advising the resident of the bylaw, maybe even... Uh, so, uh, putting a copy of it in there and um, setting out that this is a requirement uh, of course that uh, may not be effective because who's going to listen to the manager anyways and after that first letter goes out I think it should go to your condominium corporation lawyer and I think at that point in time a letter a compliance letter should go out and the um, lawyer should check carefully to see if there can be a chargeback for that specific type of letter now, I have found in my practice that there are a segment of residents who will never, ever, ever uh, voluntarily comply with any reasonable rule or use provision in the condominium documents. And what you need to do, or what we need to do as condominium lawyers, unfortunately, is through the process of appropriate and legitimate chargebacks, uh, we need to show the resident that um, there's a cost for, for poor behavior. And at a certain point, the resident realizes that the fun of misbehaving is greatly outweighed by the cost of the compliance letters. And that is, to me, important. When the cost outweighs the fun, uh, residents who refuse to comply usually will comply. And that has always been my experience. Next question. Mariam Jalali. How are you? Hello, we have a mask policy in our York Region condo, but what can be done if residents or visitors do not wear it? So we just answered that question. I guess the answer is they'll be hearing from me and they won't be happy. Jeff Stevenson, how can we enforce our new mask policy for residents that are refusing to wear them? Okay, we just answered that one. Does the City of Toronto mask bylaw supersede a corporation's mask policy? I'm going to say that um, they work together. So you cannot have something, your corporation's mask policy cannot be less 
than what the City of Toronto Mass Bylaw is, but it certainly can be more. In the same manner that the, the province of Ontario, uh, through its uh, uh, Bill 195, has the emergency orders in there, the condo corporation cannot do less than what's in the emergency order, but can do more. And I point, for example, to short-term rentals, where we have done a number of policies that are far more restrictive than what the uh, province of Ontario had initially put out. And we do that for the safety and security of the residents, which we feel um, is, 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 is greater than the economic value of having short-term rental operators running uh, unsafe businesses in the midst of residential communities. Now, next, Tova Burley. The corporation also needs to keep a reservation recording of users of gym and control gym access. Yes, that's an excellent point, Tova. Um, what we have is the by keeping a reservation record of users and the control access, you are able to do contract tracing in the event anybody was to um, uh, uh, be, subje be uh, uh, sur uh, subjected to or have this virus. So you need that for contact tracing. That's an excellent point. Leo Alvarez, bre breach of the city mask bylaw has a fine of $1,000 upon conviction. Can the corporation's policy implement the fine? So good point, Leo. Uh, we didn't mention the fine, so it's a $1,000 fine. That is correct. Condo corporations, unfortunately, in Ontario cannot um, levy fines. Fines can be levied in other jurisdictions, in other provinces, but not in Ontario. So in order to pass on a cost, it would have to be a cost as set out in your declaration. That would be like a chargeback, but there is no fines in Ontario yet. Jerry DiDonato. Number three, observation. We are in the process of holding an owner's meeting to pass an electronic meeting bylaw made at your suggestion using a hybrid and paper proxy format. Yes, hybrid uh, using paper and proxy, um, pa uh, using a hybrid and paper proxy format. So that would be, I presume, either virtual um, a, a virtual meeting with proxies, paper proxies you can have, or you would have a hybrid of virtual and in-person with proxies. Gina Avalis, condo 2173. When using the gym, would you recommend the use of waivers for each resident to sign? So I'm going to suggest, Gina, here we are again. Okay, yeah, I'm still alive. Um, I'm going to suggest that waivers are a good thing. I'm going to suggest that they're good for usage of all common elements and the waiver that you get drafted should be a general waiver setting out all your various common elements as opposed to having you know one specific waiver for each common element. I think it adds a level of protection. It's never 100 percent you know foolproof but I think it's an important thing to have. Jerry DiDonato we are in the process of holding an owner's meeting. Uh, we did that one. We've encountered extreme resistance from a few owners and we may not even obtain quorum for our meeting. Use of technology appears to be the underlying issue. So Jerry, um, I think it's a good point what you're setting out. I think what we're going to find in a lot of communities is that there's going to be tremendous resistance to virtual meetings. And I think that's going to be more the mature communities. Um, but then again, you're going to have to choose, you know, one of the other methods. And again, you know, the in-person capped at 50 with proxies um, or even nobody shows up except a few people and do the whole thing by paper. But there's ways to move forward with meetings and there's ways to satisfy, you know, uh, everybody, even your owners, if that's possible. Next, Andrea Thompson, AGM, if we hold an AGM in a hotel, and open two large rooms, one with a TV, still 50 only. Yes, so um, for convention uh, settings and um, uh, hotels and that type of thing, your in-person is still capped to 50. Uh, so this is a, another um, innovative um, question, another innovative suggestion, having two large rooms uh, with one TV. Well, you can have you know two large rooms uh, provided their maximum at capped at 50 and you have social distancing so that could work now we have here is a question from the mighty 
Rudy Petershofer, who is um, very involved um, in educating uh, the managers at his company. How are you, Rudy? For gyms, are distancing cleaning enough? What about ventilation? Respiratory droplets generated in a workout could hang in the air. Uh, Rudy, you, you waited too long. It's 12.59, this, this came in, it's 1.10. I don't know if I can answer you. But all kidding aside, um, you know, we, we've had some questions about the ventilation. Um, you know, I don't know um, really, you know, if that's, you know, if, if what the cost would be involved in such a thing, um, you know, clearly that's something to look at. But if the cost is gonna be prohibitive, um, and if that is a, an issue in your building or buildings, um, you know, I would consider whether it's the right thing to keep the gyms open or not. Um, clearly, uh, you need to measure the cost of all of these, um, of all of the reopenings. And again, you can't reopen unless you follow the safety guidelines and you have to keep the cost in consideration. So, you know, I, I don't know enough about the issue of ventilation and the medical um, opinions on the respiratory droplets vis-a-vis -vis the ventilation, but if a strong um, case study could be made to show that you need to upgrade the ventilation. Uh, at that point in time, you'd have to look at the cost involved and you know whether this, you know, if there was sufficient danger because of the ventilation, whether in fact you should be keeping those things open. Um, next question from Rudy, should we address ventilation? Should opening windows, adding air filtration be considered? Should HVAC contractor be consulted? Or is this about ventilation overkill? Uh, well, I don't know if it's ventilation overkill, but I think you're killing me right now. Um, again, I would, I would, I would, I would look to see what the medical professionals are saying, not so much as what the contractors are saying, because I'd be happy to redo your ventilation. Uh, I'd look at, you know, more what the issue is with health professionals, and I'd use that to make my determinations. Marissa Sorelli, great info, thank you. Exceptions include people who cannot wear a mask for medical reasons or children under two. Proof of a medical condition is not required. Do they have to provide a doctor's letter? Answer is you, you are um, not um, required and you should not be uh, asking for proof of the exemptions. What Marissa says is correct. If you have a existing medical condition um, you, that uh, prohibits you from wearing a mask, if you have an accommodation under the Human Rights Code that pre prevents you from wearing a mask, if you're not able to put the mask on or off by yourself, if you're two, under two years of age in Toronto, but, un, um, but under five years of age in York Region, those are your exemptions, but you can't ask for a doctor's letter. Pam Smith, another great session. Jerry DiDonato, love your humor. And so it's 1.13. Uh, we try to keep these things to an hour. I have to tell you that I have so much more to tell you. I had a whole stack of stuff, but I'm going to speak to Bradley Chaplick, who's going to be hosting the AMA next week, and I'm going to ask Brad to continue the things that I wasn't able to discuss today because there was just so much things to discuss. So I do want to thank you all for attending. Um, if you have any suggestions of other types of information or things you'd like to see on our ask me anything live chats please send us your comments um, your uh, suggestions are always welcome uh, we always have um, people writing in and and saying things they'd like to see and we read all of that don't forget every tuesday we have our faq coming out and we update it every single week for you as well we have our friday uh, lawyer videos on condominium case law um, so that's it for this week. Um, again, I want to thank everybody. And now I'm going to go and run back to my desk upstairs and return all my phone calls from all my RA clients. Why didn't I call them back today between 12 and 1? But I was with you doing something really important. So thank you all so much. We'll see you next week.